you know, we hold high value, you know, not just in, you know, the beautiful time that we have in worship and, you know, being in the word and praying, but just the, the relationships that are, that are being built out and developed right now. We, we believe this is one of the most important pieces of what God is doing in the body of Christ right now is really connecting people in relationship, connecting tribes, connecting armies. And uh, yesterday, some of us, we had a chance to um, go to celebrate uh, the 20 year anniversary of Hollywood Prayer Network. How many of you guys were out there yesterday? A few of you guys, HPN, you know, our, our really good friends, uh, Karen Covell, Jim and Karen Covell, they started Hollywood Prayer Network 20 years ago. And they were sharing stories of even when they first came into Hollywood uh, back in what it was, uh, 2001, they were saying so many people advised them to not come. So many people were critical of them you know, coming into this city, which they already had deemed as lost and God, you know, forgotten. And they had so many battles that they had to fight, you know, just to come into here, come into Hollywood, to begin to pray for Hollywood, to begin to um, just release the message that Hollywood needs kingdom believers. Hollywood needs, you know, kingdom people to create so that they can release the, the, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the beauty of hope through this through arts, entertainment, and media. And, you know, we had a chance to celebrate, and it's just so amazing. Um, you know, what God is doing in this hour is, is really, um, it's exciting. It's stretching our minds. You know, it's, uh, we're seeing so many people come to know Jesus. We're seeing so many people being awakened who were once going to church as little kids and now coming back to him and just seeing these prodigals come home. And so it is such an exciting time in the body of Christ. And, and I, I can, can't emphasize it enough. I think um, even through our worship and through uh, what Milchin just shared and Alma, what Alma just prayed, this is a time where the body of Christ is getting ready. It's a time when we need to be prepared. It's a time, because it is, these are exciting times, but there are also times when we need to, the body of Christ needs to be strong. The body of Christ needs to be confident in who we are and what we are called to do in this hour, because there is no, I, I believe we've never lived in a more challenging hour, you know, to be believers. We have never lived in a more um, intense environment than we are living in right now. And it is so imperative that we as the body of Christ have laid our roots deep in the Lord and that we are watchful, we are wise, we are full of peace, we are full of um, grace and mercy and forgiveness and and not holding on to offense because all of these things, any little piece that the enemy can try to grab a hold of and get access of in our life or in our heart, he will take access of it. And so this is that time for us to really prepare, to really go deep in the Lord. And, um, you know, I think many of you, I don't know if you guys have been just even following what's been going on around the world um, you know, to me, it seems like one week is like a, a, like a month's worth of news, you know, <laughs> what's going on, um, you know, and a lot of the news has not been great. Um, you know, even, even in the world, you know, Haiti had a 7.2 earthquake, um, you know, just hours ago, um, incredible damage, um, you know, in that nation. We just heard this morning, I don't know when it happened, but there's volcanic eruptions going on in, in Alaska, three of them, and they're intensifying and growing over there. And then internationally, in Afghanistan, the Taliban, who we thought had been stripped of their power, has come back, and they, have, they are beginning to overrun um, the, the nation again. You know, it was once under control. Um, it was turning, 
And now, you know, there's, there's the opposition has risen back up, and I think they were about to take the capital city um, as of last night, this morning, and there's just reports. Yeah, and there's reports of horrendous things that the Taliban is doing. You know, they're, they're ravaging homes, property, families. They're taking, you know, young, young women and children. And uh, it is just, it, it's really, it's, it's troubling. It's, it's really troubling what's going on globally. And I, I believe that, you know, this is part of the shaking. You know, when, when there is a, a time when, the, when a generation begins to turn their hearts away from the Lord, you know, the enemy will come. The enemy will, will begin to become bolder and bolder and bolder in, in how he operates and how he manifests himself. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us very clearly that towards these days, you know, when lawlessness increases, when, when we're heading towards, um, you know, more darkness and, and, and more activity of the enemy, that there is going to be times of great shaking. There is going to be earthquakes. There is going to be famines. There is going to be pestilence. There is going to be fighting. There is going to be, um, you know, wars between nations. And there is going to be wars inside of the nations themselves. And so we feel like this is such a critical time right now, um, even here in 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 California, I don't know if you guys heard the news this week, um, but they're threatening to, um, you know, to shut down the the city, you know, the for those for access for the inside of the city for those that have not been vaccinated. Have you guys been following the news a little bit? And so th there's just a lot of things going on. But you know what? We really believe that above the fray, you know, God is in control. You know, God is moving and God, God is, is about to do something, you know, in our, in our city, in our nation and all of these things, all of the plans and agendas, they're going to, they're going to implode. They are real. They're going to literally implode. But we, we, as the church, we need to be vigilant. We need to, we, as a church, we need to be in prayer. And so I remember, I was just reminded of this, you know, when we first came into Hollywood, you know, we're, we've been here 10 years now, and there was a time, I, we shared a little bit about this, but when we first came into Hollywood, it was such a difficult place for us to be. We had some of the same things that, you know, Karen and Jim Covell experienced. A lot of them are, why are you going to Hollywood? Like, why are you going to, you know, do ministry in a city where, you know, where God is not even there anymore? <laughs> and... Um, and many people questioned why we came here. But when we first landed, we experienced tremendous turbulence here. You know, we, you know our marriage got attacked. Our finances got attacked. Um, all of our leaders, almost every single one of them, you know, got attacked, you know, in the first two, three months here. And it was almost like a full out assault against any kingdom work being done in Hollywood. And we remember it was during that time. We, you know, God had called us to, to plant a house of prayer. And we were like, we have got to pray. We have got to pray. You know, we had a vision to do night and day prayer. And so we, um, but to be honest, when we started gathering in the house of prayer just to do watches for an hour, two hours, three hours, all of a sudden we began, like, we began to feel rest. You know, we began to, like, the warfare became less and less heavy upon us as we were doing watches. And I remember our leaders talking to each other says, we need to do our watches. We need to be in the house of prayer. We need to continue to do this. And, uh, and to be honest, those first months, it wasn't really about praying for revival or praying for Hollywood or praying for souls. It was like survival for us to just sit in the house of prayer to pray. You know, it was like, we need to go 24 seven here so that we can have a covering here so that we can survive, you know, so that we're not all going to lose our jobs and all lose our homes and, and, and whatnot. And so, but, but, this is something that the Lord taught us really early on, that in the midst of turbulence and hardship and attacks and things that are trying to rob us of our peace, the safest place for us to be is in the presence of the Lord. The safest place that we can possibly be is in prayer. The, the safest place that we could possibly be is when we are worshiping the Lord. And that's where we, 
we meet the Lord. That's where we hear the Lord. And that's where we gain confidence in the Lord. You know, when we're constantly with the Lord and we're hearing his heart, what he's saying about us and what he's saying about our situations. How many of you guys know God is bigger than any situation? God is bigger than anything that's going on in L.A. He's bigger than, you know, all these earthquakes and all these um, natural disasters. He's bigger than what's going on in the Middle East. He's bigger than what's going on in Afghanistan now. But we but if we will find ourselves in him and I believe this is really the the challenge to the believers all across the earth now is not to deal with things on our natural with our natural strength it's not to go out and figure things out it's not to fight uh, it's not even a protest or or whatnot but I believe the greatest thing right now is to get into the place of the presence of God and begin to pray and to war and to hear what God is saying and if the church positions itself like that you know we are going to see endless breakthroughs you know in every in every single place region and things and circumstances that we are that we are you know that the world is in upheaval about and so i just want to i just want to encourage us this morning um you know we're going to talk a little bit um, you know, one of the, the, the stories where, which God has really been um, speaking to me over the last couple weeks and, you know, and, and a lot in the last 18 months is the story of Daniel. And um, we're going to be in Daniel, but can we just bow our heads for a moment? I just want us to just take like 30 seconds. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts this morning. The word doesn't come through a, a message, a preacher. It comes through the revelation of the Holy Spirit as our hearts are open to receive. Let's just posture our hearts. Let's invite God to speak loud into our ears, into our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence that is in this place. Father, we thank you for this, these 30 days, Lord, the, the month of Elul that we spoke about this morning, a time of preparation, a time of heart searching, a time of getting our lives in proper order and alignment with your will. And God, we invite you, Lord, to move us. We invite you to move us from where we are, how we stepped in into these four walls today. God, we invite you to move us any which way towards you, any which way towards your will for our life. And so we pray, Lord, for a, a special anointing over your word, over over the book of Daniel, Lord, as we, as we step in today, God, we pray for a fresh revelation, fresh eyes, Lord, to, to see your word, to absorb your word, and to apply your word. So, Father, we, yeah, we thank you, Lord, that you are alive, that you are moving, you are working, and that you are preparing your people in this hour. So we commit ourselves into your hands in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You know the the book of Daniel. How many of you guys have have studied the book of Daniel? I mean like really been in the book of Daniel for a good number. Okay, awesome. If you guys have, you know, done any kind of study, you'll you'll realize that this book um even to today cuz a lot of, you know, a lot of people believe um, that Daniel is, you know, there was, 
Daniel lived in, in, um, in 600 BC Babylon. But we are here in Los Angeles, in Hollywood. We believe there is a lot of what is going on in this book, a lot of what is written, and a lot of the same struggles and challenges that Daniel and his three friends went through in this book parallel what is happening in this city. Um, how many of you guys have heard Hollywood is like modern day Babylon? How many of you guys, how many of you guys have heard of that? And if you guys don't believe it, um, there is actually a, you know, a structure um, on Hollywood and Highland. It's a replica of the Babylonian gate, you know, as it was in the, ta in the time of Nebuchadnezzar and in the time of Daniel. And so there literally is a, is a spirit that the enemy has tried to bring over this city, which is really some of the same things that we see Daniel and his friends you know, brought up against. And I would say even more so in this day, um, we're not going to have a chance to go through the whole book of Daniel. We may be in Daniel several times, you know, over the, the next few weeks. But, um, but a lot, even the circumstances of what is going on here in America, here in California, is very similar to how the book of Daniel started in, in Daniel chapter 1. And so... Um, if you guys have your Bibles, if you guys could just turn with me, want to just get a little background here. I know most of you are familiar, but I'm just going to read a few verses so that we can get into this text, understanding what is going on in the background. Um, we're going to start at the top, Daniel 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And I just want to stop here. Um, you know, there was a... Here in Daniel 1, there was a, there was a war. There was an overtaking by the Babylonians, which was the, which was the most powerful empire of this day. And they overtook the Israelites. And, and they won the war. And they took the Israelites into captivity. It's called the Babylonian captivity. It happened for 70 years. It lasted 70 years. And, and the Bible tells us during this time that what they did was they was the king ordered for all of the talented, good-looking, wise young men to be gathered in to the king's palace so that they could come and they could train, quote-unquote, train them and teach them the ways of the Babylonians, teach them the ways of the Chaldeans. Granted, if you could really think about this, you know, probably just, you know, a few days ago or a month ago, two days, two months ago, the Israelites were in freedom. They were worshiping their worshiping God. They had the freedom to, you know, to go wherever they want, do whatever they want, worship wherever they want. But all of a sudden, in just a moment, everything changed. Everything changed. And then they they went from free men to a nation in captivity. And so this is where we pick up this story. And, they, and you know, they, the king was very smart. He was like, if we can train the best and the brightest. And, and you know, kind of like, I, I believe if he was looking around America and was looking for the most influential and the best looking and the most powerful, he would probably come straight to Hollywood. And he would look for some of the most talented folks and say, I want to take you and I want to train your mind. I want to, I want to train you in the ways. And that if, 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 if young Hollywood would be trained in the ways of the Chaldeans, then all of a sudden everyone, all the Israelites would be impacted. Are you guys following me? Yeah. 
this was the agenda. Was this guy smart? I, I think he was very smart. He, I mean, he, he had a crazy mind, but he, I think he was very smart in what he was doing. And so this is what happened. It says this. It says, the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine. So then he, I, I want you to catch this, and I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to sound sarcastic or anything. But, but this is what happened. They began, to, they, they began to tell these people and say, hey, this is, this is the food for, they, for the day. This is what you're going to eat. This is what you're going to drink. Granted, they're in the king's palace and they were being treated well. Okay? And, then, and then appointed for them what they should, that they should be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. And so basically they were going to educate them. They're going to say, this is what you're going to learn. These are the books you're going to read. This is the language you're going to master. And you're going to, you're going to adapt. You're going to learn the ways of Babylon. And that was really the goal of, of what's going on here in the book of Daniel. And so if you, if you kind of think about this, you know, this was what happened to Israel. I don't know if we ever have this perspective, but what happened to Israel was they lost their freedom. They lost their ability to choose. They lost their ability to decide. They, you, if you read more of Daniel, you'll know they lost their ability to worship the God that they knew they were to worship. And they were told what to do. They were told what to eat. They were told what to read. They were told what to believe. Does it sound somewhat familiar? This is, uh, this is, this is the environment. This is the environment where Daniel and his friends stepped into. They never knew that this was what, they, what was going to happen to them. But this, this is what they stepped into in a moment in time. Over maybe a period of a week or two, they all, they, 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 they came into this life where they were in the palace and under, you know, under this new authority or, and mandates that they had over their life. Verse 8. And I love this. And I, I don't know if there's, there's a more pertinent verse for for really the the people of God right now Daniel 1 8 it says but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he would drink so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself and now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. And for, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over them, Please test your servants for 10 days and let us give, be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearances of the youth who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. So I, I want to, th this is what happened was, and, and I believe in the months and years leading up to this very, very day when the king began to order what the, you know, these, these influential young men were going to do, eat, whatever, that Daniel and his friends were getting themselves ready. God was preparing their hearts. The Bible tells us, you know, in Daniel chapter um, Chapter 6, that Daniel was a young, young man. He prayed three times a day. How many of you guys remember that? He, he, he always prayed three times a day. It got him in trouble. But this was a part of his life. This was a part of his preparation. He heard the Lord. He prayed the Lord. Prayed to the Lord. And he had confidence in the Lord. And we also know, if you really think about this, like Daniel, when he was presented with the king's food and all of this, he 
And his friend says, we are gonna, we're going to abstain and we're going to fast. We are going to fast. This tells me, this is probably not the first time. How many of you think this is the first time Daniel ever fasted? I don't think so. I believe this is a part of his lifestyle. In fact, in Daniel, you'll see again. He, Daniel was the, man, was the fasting man. He fasted 10 days. He fasted 21 days in Daniel chapter 10 and, and changed the atmosphere of what was going on over a nation. And, and so Daniel, because he had cultivated this lifestyle, he was a man of presence. He was a man that no matter what was going on in life, he always set his time to pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. He was a man that fasted to draw upon the revelation and the power and the strength of the Lord. And so whenever, when this happened, when they began to lose their freedom, and all of a sudden the king says, hey, this is what you're going to eat. I don't believe this was a food and wine issue for Daniel. Daniel probably saw and said, you know what, there is an agenda. This king who doesn't honor and follow and worship the Lord is trying to tell us and mandate us to do certain things, and I'm just not with it. I'm just not with it. And so I am going to, I am going to stand, and I am going to, and I am going to be different, and maybe God is going to use this to bring glory to his name. And I just want to say this. There are going to be times in, in, that we are living in right now where we are going to, we're going to have to fight our battles. We're going to have to pick our battles. And some of them may seem little, and some of them might be really big. But there, but there is going to be times if we are listening to the Lord, we are going to know which battles we're going to fight. So I just want to say this to here. Like, I know there's so many issues and so many things that we're fighting for um, in our city, politically, government, education. I just want to say that God is going to highlight and put his finger upon things that we need to stand for. Yes. That we need to stand. And, and even if they seem petty, God is going to somehow use our strength and our obedience in him. To reveal Jesus. Amen. So that's, that's, so Daniel says in verse 8 that Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food. And, and, you know, when you, when he did that, when he withstand, with, uh, I, I mean, withheld from eating. And, and I know the spirit of the Lord was speaking to him. The spirit of the Lord had anointed him. Yeah, and I just want to say one more thing. When you take a stand for something that you believe is, is for the Lord, for righteousness, all of a sudden, not just the presence of God will come, but the favor of the Lord will be up, upon you. Yeah. You know, he is going to come upon you. You don't need to be afraid. I, 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 wanna, I can't emphasize this enough. The battle right now is not. In, in man's strength is not in flesh and blood. It is all through. It's all in the spirit right now. This is the only battle that we can fight right now. I don't even understand how Christians can survive right now if they're not in the place of prayer, if they're not in the place of listening to the Lord, because we can only fight so much and fight so hard in the natural. And I tell you, it's a losing battle. But those who will fight in the Lord, those that will fight on their knees, those that will fight in worship, God is going to, God is going to go before us. So, so look, look what happened when, when Daniel made this decision. He was like, I'm going to stand out. There's nothing wrong with eating good food. How you guys know that? <laughs> Fine food and wine, you know? I like food. Anyone like food around here? Yes. We, we all love food. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but Daniel was like, I am going to fight oppression. I am going to fight the enemy's agenda. And I am going to stand out. I'm going to stand out. We don't want to pick fights just to pick a fight. We want to pick fights that God wants to highlight himself. That's how we need to discern. That's why we need to be in prayer. And so... When Daniel took this stand, in verse 9, it says, Then God 
granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord, the king who has appointed your food and your drink. Why should he see your faces looking haggard? Um, then, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. So I just wanted to listen to this. this. There was so much favor on Daniel standing and this time for this issue that, the, that this young man who was serving the king risked his life to give Daniel a chance. That's how much favor was on Daniel. He risked his life and said, hey, hey, if you do this, you know, I might die if, if you actually, you know, look, look haggard or look tired and don't, don't look as healthy. You know, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to give you a chance. You, th that's how the Lord works. That's how the Lord is. When we're walking with God, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So at the end of 10 days, verse 15, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. Imagine that. The overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. In the verse 17, it says, and as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. And Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And so what happened was they were, they were found strong. They weren't even brought before the king yet. They were found strong. The person who had given them favor, they were like, man, they look good. Man, they're getting smarter. Man, they're learning better. Man, they know they're, they're, they're just excelling. And so he kept doing it. And so for three years, Daniel and his friends fasted. Three years. This is the fasted lifestyle. They, they, for all these days, they, they gave themselves and said, Lord, he knew that the Lord had an assignment for them in Babylon. And they said, I am surrendered. I am yours. And I'm going to separate myself from the fray. I'm going to be separate. Then, verse 18, then finally, at the end of the days, after three years, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. And then verse 20. I love this verse. It says, as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king had consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And so I just want to say this. There, we're in a time, I know some of you have been fasting. Some of you guys might have just finished the fast. I, I'm just going to say this. Um, we, as the body of Christ, need to learn sacrifice in this time. It is it's so imperative that we learn sacrifice. You know, when I, when I first came into Hollywood, it was just really when we first started praying to Hollywood, um, I started doing a fast. I, started, I fasted every single Wednesday. This was, this was, once again, this was like for my survival, right? <laughs> it was... My first six months in Hollywood, honey, honey, you can tell some stories too. My first six months in Hollywood were so, were so hard on us and our family and our marriage that we were like, we have got to fast. And we called our leaders to fast. So every Wednesday for 24 hours, we would do a liquid fast. Every single one of us, we did. Some of them did it for a, for a few months. Some of them did it for a year. I did it for about six years. And I gave, I gave my Wednesdays to the Lord. Um, and, and, you know, still today, the Lord's been speaking to me. I, I, I probably love food more than anybody else here. <laughs> I, not to, no, I, no, I, sh I, I, I take that back. I'm sure a lot of you guys love food too. <laughs> I love food a lot. Yes, I know Dion does. And, uh, and so, um, but I believe one of the things that God is challenging the church with right now 
is that we need to just live surrendered. Amen. We need to live with open hearts, open minds. You know, Daniel and his friends, they never knew that when they walked into Babylon, they were going to give up so many things. They never knew they were going to stand up, you know, to to Nebuchadnezzar and get thrown in a fiery furnace, stand up to Darius and get thrown into the lion's den. They didn't know that. They, they didn't know, but it, they were surrendered and they were prepared and they were prayed up and they were fasting. And it's very interesting here. Um, you know, they fasted for 10 days, you know, to begin. The people always think they fasted 10 days. They didn't fast 10 days. They fasted three years. But they committed to 10 days of fasting. And they committed, and those 10 days of fasting ended up making them 10 times wiser yeah. than everybody else. So their fasting multiplied their wisdom and their revelation and their favor and, and, their, and their process. And I believe we're coming into a time again. Fasting is probably not a good word in our vocabulary, but I believe there, the, this, the times that we are living in, it calls for the church to be powerful. It calls for the church to be surrendered, and it calls for the church to be in the presence of God, and there, there, really, there really is no other way right now. You know, it's, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by the Spirit of God, you know? Uh, you know, I, I believe, I, I'm believing for a lot of things. You know, we are, we've been praying for probably a year now. And, and I just want to say this before we close. We are, it's one of the most important things, not that we're just praying for ourselves, praying for Hollywood, but we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray that God would topple people that are not supposed to be in position, those that are carrying agendas. We need to pray. I believe there is a, there is a moment of breakthrough if God's people will hear and pray. That God, that there is going to be exposure that's going to take place at the highest levels. We don't know when. But if we're going to see America turn, it is, we have got to see our nation turn. And we have got to see those in power either repent or be removed. It's a bold prayer. But we've got to hold. The Lord's been just, I've, I've been praying this for, for quite a while now. We need to hold the line. We need to hold the line. We need to pray right now and pray that God will begin to do the work of ex exposure. That's how our nation is going gonna, is gonna to return back to the Lord. Because if, if things don't change, and we've said it here before, if things don't change, we are going to rapidly head towards an accelerated, out of God's timetable, end time agenda. If we don't pray. And so I, I just want to challenge us. You know, I, I believe this is a very mature community. You know, I, I wouldn't go into a, any church and, and, and share this kind of message. But, but we, as, as, the, as the praying church, a church that understands the presence of God, understands the power of um, warfare, of fasting to shift atmospheres, we need to position ourselves. We need to surrender ourselves, and we need to yeah. yield, and we need to, and we need to be in God's presence. It's, 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 it is the utmost important. I believe that's what these next 24 days of Alel are going to be, is to get ourselves prepared, because I don't know what's going to go down, you know? I know what God's, God's best is for our nation. I know what God's best is for Los Angeles, but I also know that if we are not praying and the church is not standing when God tells us to stand, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a rough road for America. So let, let's bow our heads. You know, I just want to read as with our heads bowed. After Daniel and his friends fasted and the king saw the favor of God on their life. After they threw 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace for not bowing down to that idol, which was mandated from the top down, and saw God save them. And then when the king saw Daniel praying, thrown into the lion's den, the lion's den because that was against the law during that time to pray to any other God besides him. And he saw the deliverance come. This is what, this is what King Darius wrote in Daniel chapter 6 after hearing and witnessing all these things says to all the peoples nations and men of every language who are living in all the land may your peace abound I make a decree today that in all the dominion of my kingdom men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel for he is the living God and enduring forever for his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and he rescues and he performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this, Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Think about this. That the king of wicked, dark, violent, idolatrous Babylon makes a decree. And he says that all of the, all of the kingdom shall worship the God of Daniel. This is what happens. When God's people are surrendered, when God's people are prepared, when God's people are spiritually vigilant and alive, hearing the voice of the Lord, discerning the things in the Spirit, favor comes, signs and wonders come deliverance comes and nations see the power of God at work and nations and kings hearts change Father we come this morning Lord and we we know that we are we're no one special we're one of billions that you have created to live on this earth. But we have you, God. We have your Holy Spirit living in us. We have been called sons and daughters of the King. We are, we are heirs of the Lord God Most High. That's what makes us something. And Father, we pray that in this hour, Lord, that there would be a fresh anointing, God, upon those that have chosen to surrender to you, God. Those that are, those that are not under the mandate, Lord, of, of kings and queens and laws and rules, God, but that we are under the ruling kingdom of Jesus. And Father, we pray, Lord, that there would be a confidence that would arise in all your sons and daughters in this hour. God, the same spirit that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked in, Lord, in the days of Babylon. Father, we pray, Lord, that same spirit would fall afresh on us. The same boldness would fall afresh on us. That same clarity of mind would fall afresh on us. That same intimacy with you, God, to hear your voice would fall afresh on us this morning. 
Can we just stretch out our hands? Fall afresh on us, Lord. Fall afresh on us. Father, we don't know how exactly Daniel and his friends prepared. But Father, we know, Lord, that their communion with you was the most important thing in their lives. It is greater than their work. It's greater than making a living, making money, making friends. It was communion with you. Sometimes deepened by worship. Sometimes deepened by prayer. Sometimes deepened by sacrifice through fasting. And Father, this morning, we want to be like Daniel's in modern day Babylon. We want to be a church that is alive, a church that is powerful, a church that is united, a church that is in love with you, God, a church that will spare nothing, Lord, to see your kingdom come. So, Father, we pray that you would prepare us, that you would show us how to be ready, to be bold, to be filled with the power and the favor that only comes from your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray especially in these next three and a half weeks as we get ready for the new Jewish year, as we as there's a special anointing for preparation, God, we, we pray, Lord, that we would step into it, Lord. That we would change our schedules, change our lifestyles, change our focuses if necessary, God. We want to be centered. We want to be centered. We want to be yoked to your presence. That it would be the most important thing. Communion with you, God. Communion, communion with you, Lord. Wherever we are now, God, where, whether we're, we've been far away, whether we've been in church for a long time, whether we're on, our hearts are on fire for you, God, Father, we, we just pray for a deeper measure of communion, of intimacy. Ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Pray, Lord, for that grace over this community, over everyone at the sound of my voice, online, through YouTube. Pray for the release of the grace to be near Jesus. near to Jesus. So Father, we thank you. Lord, we, we thank you for what you are doing across the earth. Father, even in the midst of all the tragedy and turbulence and things that are happening around the earth, Father, we, we just pray, Lord, that your hand will be above and over all of these situations that you will turn what the enemy has meant for evil for good for salvation father we we even pray a special prayer for the people of afghanistan right now god we pray a special protection over the body of christ lord in that nation god we pray that you would shelter them god that they would that they would be found in bunkers and in, in basements in places where the taliban cannot find them god we pray that you would spare their lives spare their families spare the women spare the young children god we pray for mercy god 
pray for mercy over them, God. And we pray that as a nation in Afghanistan, that there would be a great awakening that would come out of this place, Lord. That they would not search anymore, Lord, for man-made solutions or even for government or for, for America to save them, but that they would look deeper and higher, God, to you, God, the hope, their hope, their only hope. So we pray, God, we pray for your hand over that nation, all the people of Afghanistan. We pray for miracles. We pray for protection. God, and we pray for your spirit to move over that land, that you would turn what the enemy has meant for evil, for good. So, Father, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you're our Father, that you watch over us and you protect us. And God, we just pray for in this coming week, Lord, we plead your blood over us, every single one of us, from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. God, we pray for protection, Lord, against any injuries, accidents, sickness, virus, COVID-19, this Delta variant. God, we just push it back from our bodies and we push it back from our families. We push it back from our loved ones. We just declare that it will not touch us in the name of Jesus. And that we just pray, Lord, for a fresh new boldness to come forth, Lord, through this company. Lord, that wherever you take us, in the studios, God, in meetings, God, in in, in the workplace, Lord, in over meals, God, that you would use us to speak the hope that is in Jesus, to speak life into those that you bring across our path in these next seven days. So we thank you. We love you. Use us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.